they may be real, or they may be fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, and we've all come across the, the had experience of you know, large organisations um, who've tried to undermine um, open source by uh, pretending that it's actually a lot more riskier than it is. So what we have here are two different sets of risks, the, the perceived risks that the lawyer comes already equipped with, and then a completely different set of risks that the community has. And when dealing with a lawyer, what you really need to do is to educate them um, to make sure that they, 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 they are aware, aware that the community's perception of risk may be different from the default perception that they have already. So I'm just going to give a couple of very brief examples of um, where this applies in the real world. So employment contracts very frequently say that employees are restricted from using company intellectual property um, outside the work environment. Um, and they will also say that some form of uh, restriction continues to subsist after that employee is left. Now, that, that would be totally unexceptional to a lawyer, and they would expect uh, any employment contract to have a couple of clauses like that. But that can create a real problem for an organisation uh, that is based on free and open source software, especially if they're using GPL code, because um, that, uh, those particular clauses within an employment contract can count as an additional restriction uh, under the GPL licensing model. Um, another example, um, and I know that Dan Shearer is going to talk about this a bit later um, in, in greater depth, so I'll, I'll just sort of cover it fairly sketchily now, um, is in terms of contribution agreements to a project. So um, lawyers' assumptions can lead to a very developer-friendly contribution agreement. So they can insist that the contributor assigns all of their um, IPR to the particular project. Um, they can uh, insist on warranties. Um, in terms of the, the quality and the provenance of the code from the particular contributor. And they can even ask for indemnities. Um, so the, the uh, contributor will indemnify the project uh, if it turns out that that code has infringed a patent, for example. And those are all terribly negative things as far as, um, as, 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 far as a contributor are concerned. So the question is, um, are those risks real? And do they outweigh the benefit of, to, of having um, a, a, a thriving, um, and well-staffed uh, contributor pool. So these practical problems can often be dealt with in contribution agreements um, by encouraging the developers to contribute with much more, um, with, with much more friendly terms. Um, so the sort of things that we might look at um, is letting the contributors have their own code back freely, um, or even in certain cases, allowing them to have access to the entire code base, not just the contribution that they made themselves. Um, asking for very minimal warranties, the same things like just so far as the uh, contributor is aware, they're, what, what they're contributing is their own work and that they're not infringing. Um, and then having some sort of mechanism for preventing a, um, preventing a project from becoming evil. So um, if the project becomes closed according to some certain criteria, um, then, uh, for example, all of the code base will automatically become available under a PSP or a Apache or, or a GPL license, for example. So there's a number of projects that have some sort of mechanism like that. Um, and, uh, but also retaining the ability um, to relicense, because a, a project will often want to relicense for any number of reasons. Some of them may be bad reasons to, to um, effectively close down the code, but some of them may be good reasons. Quite often it's because it's realised that the project needs to merge with another project and that the license is for example, licenses come along, and so on and so, so forth. And one of the major difficulties with relicensing actually is just finding the developers in the first place. Most of the relicensing projects that I've been involved with uh, have been ones where the relicensing has not, not been so much a question of the developers being unhappy about the relicensing occurring, but uh, once you can find them and tell them the reasons why the relicensing needs to happen, then they're normally perfectly happy about it. So actually trying finding them uh, is the most important thing. Um, or just don't have a contribution agreement at all. Just rely on the GPL itself, um, which is something that uh, the Linux kernel development has historically done. So, how can you make the most of your lawyer? Well, you've got to recognise, I mean, I've been pretty down on a lot of lawyers. Lawyers can be useful. Um, they know things that a lot of other people don't. Uh, for example, they know that certain terms may mean things that are not what you think it means. So some of these highly technical terms that appear to have standard meanings are words like distribution or to copy or derivative work. So they're all terms of art and they have very specific meanings. It's also because the law always has exceptions. It's a set of rules and there are exceptions to every rule. And some of the sort of examples of these um, are that any exclusions of liability that you have in a contract 
or a license. Uh, they may well not be binding because they're very heavy, that's a very heavily regulated uh, area of contracting. Um, exhaustion of rights is, is, is an interesting issue um, in the European Union, or the right of first sale, um, as it's called in the United States, um, which means that once a piece of software has been released to the public, then the copyright owner can no longer control the circulation of that piece of software. And that has some interesting ramifications, uh, which I won't go into at the moment, but you can ask me later if you want, um, in terms of uh, the GPL, for example. Um, and one other counterintuitive thing is that liability for faulty code doesn't necessarily follow the copyright ownership. Uh, people assume that if you're the copyright owner of the code and you license that code to other people, you're automatically um, accepting liability for faults in the code, unless you explicitly disclaim them. That's not the case. Um, the, uh, the, the liability for faults in the code rests with the, um, the, the people who wrote the code in the first place. So these are all sort of slightly counterintuitive things that you need a lawyer to explain to you and to, to, to help navigate around. But it's also worth, worth bearing in mind that lawyers do actually respect technologists and programmers. Um, this is a little survey that um, we at Moorcrofts did a couple of weeks ago, um, and we asked a number of questions of lawyers, most of whom um, specialise in free and open source software. Um, and 68% of the lawyers thought that the chief technical officers that they were dealing with had good knowledge and understanding of free and open source software law. 88% thought that developers had good knowledge of free and open source software law. Um, I haven't asked the question, of, um, but I'm sure that if I had to ask lawyers in other fields whether they thought that their clients you know, had a good, solid understanding of the law, I'm sure an awful lot of them uh, would say, no, they know very little. Uh, they, incidentally, they do have a different view of the chief executive officers that they're dealing with. Um, over 60% of these free and open source software lawyers thought that CEOs didn't know very much about FOSS law at all. Um, and 16% thought CEOs were completely clueless. Um, that's about FOSS law, that was the question. <coughs> um, it's also interesting to note that um, these FOSS lawyers, 77% of them profess to have some programming skills themselves, um, even if uh, those skills um, were, were a little rusty. And um, we also asked the question about what categories of um, person within a particular client company these lawyers liked working with best. So the people they liked working with best uh, were the developers. Um, next, they liked working with the in-house lawyer and, and the CTO. And in my experience, um, in-house lawyers uh, are, uh, of um, large organizations who specialize in free and open source software um, are actually the most knowledgeable lawyers out there in terms of free and open source software. Um, so it was a tie between the in-house lawyer and the CTO. Um, they were sort of reasonably happy about dealing with um, contract negotiators. Uh, they weren't too happy about dealing with chief executive officers. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, they really didn't like dealing with chief finance officers very much at all. Um, and they really hated dealing with sales staff. Um, so a few other statistics. 68% uh, of these lawyers thought that programming had a fair amount in common with legal drafting. 39% uh, of them admitted that, um, at least partly, they became a lawyer uh, because they couldn't make a grade uh, as a programmer. So do lawyers actually believe in the FOSS model? Um, some of us do. Um, so I'll give you a few examples here. My firm, Moorcrofts, um, is currently working with Emerge Open um, to develop uh, legal documents using an open source model. Um, so the idea is that once we've got the first draft of that, uh, then we're going to release that um, into the wild and let people comment on it um, and develop it um, and, and use it freely. Um, so uh, it's really that, that, that's sort of, um, looking at the collaborative R&D model. Um, also, the UK Cabinet Office, with office which is the, the sort of senior ministry which is charged um, with dealing with all procurement issues within the UK government, um, has also um, expressed an interest in open source procurement documents, um, and uh, we'll be working with them um, to, uh, to, to, to try to get a suite of very simplified documents uh, that people are able to use during the procurement uh, process. <coughs> Um, 
And also there's uh, an organization called Docracy.com in the United States. Um, I went to see them a few weeks ago. They're based in Brooklyn. Um, they're a very interesting little startup. Um, they're, they're quite well funded. Um, and uh, their business model is that um, they publish legal documents um, on an open source basis. They have their, their own license, um, so they've chosen not to use them on Creative Commons licenses. Um, but essentially, um, it is um, a, a sort of GitHub for legal documents, uh, but it's pre-populated with a bunch of legal documents. Um, and once we've developed uh, the suite of the documents that we're going to be using um, with the Merge Open Cabinet Office, then we intend to upload some of these to Docracy.com as well. So that demonstrates that uh, you know, there are lawyers out there who understand the open source process and um, are interested in using it uh, in terms of their own businesses. So how do you get the best out of your lawyer? Well, it might be worthwhile seeing if they have some programming skills. But probably the most practical piece of advice is you really need to explain the risks that you're concerned about. So do not rely on their default assumptions. We've explored what some of those default assumptions are, and unless you, you challenge those default assumptions, um, then you may find that uh, you're stuck with some assumptions that really don't fit very well um, alongside your business model. Remember that lawyers do like working with technical and knowledgeable people, um, so they will respect the technologists for their skill, um, and they may even feel that they're a programmer uh, more capable themselves. Uh, lawyers also dislike the chief finance officer as much as uh, respect the fact that lawyers are naturally unsociable. I'm still having difficulty understanding where that statistic came from, but anyway, it's, it's, it's there um, in, in the published material. Um, pick your lawyer with care. Um, lawyers are strange. Lawyers are not like other people. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Are you aware of where IBM Unisys discovered that the final programmers back in the 50s before people went to school to become programmers? Uh, no, but you're about to tell me. <laughs> Junior attorneys. That's really interesting. That is, that is really interesting. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, Silva. Yes, question. How many lawyers did you have in your uh, study? The last one about your... Uh, 26. So a fairly small sample size, I'm afraid. Uh, can you go back to two slides before about collaborative R&D? Yes. Yeah. Well, working with Emerge Open to develop legal documents using open source model, what do you mean? I mean? Can you explain a bit more what it means collaborative R&D? Um, well, when I'm explaining the, the open source model to people, um, I find that the most a powerful way to explain it um, is to talk about it in terms of collaborative R&D. So what I mean by that is, um, uh, if I take an example from the automotive world, um, so I used to have a Mini, um, and the Mini has an engine in it, uh, even though the Mini is made by BMW, it has an engine in it which is identical to an engine um, that I think is I think it's in the Lugia Citroen cars, um, a number of other cars, they, they, have, they have exactly the same engine. So presumably um, uh, BMW um, and Lugia Citroen uh, got together and decided that it was a good idea to, um, to collaborate uh, to develop this particular engine. And the interesting thing is it's in the Mini, um, and it, that means that BMW is not interested in differentiating the Mini on its engine. It just needs, it needs an engine that is powerful, is economical, is reliable, but is ultimately boring. It's ultimately just an engine. It's not a key differentiator. Um, the key differentiator for the Mini is its styling, um, and uh, the cachet of the brand, etc., etc., etc. But from a legal perspective, if you think about 
um, the, uh, the amount of legal effort and the amount, the amount of negotiation that must have gone into putting that collaboration together. It must have been enormous, and I can imagine that the collaboration agreements between the various car manufacturers involved it went on for thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. With the open source model, you can achieve collaboration um, without any additional documentation at all, other than the, the licenses that the, 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 um, that the code is, is released under anyway. But it's very compelling if you're developing some code that is not a key differentiator for you. So the question for us as lawyers is, can we apply the same thing to documents? And it seems to me that, that you know, a legal model, uh, the, 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 the business model of running a legal business, should be very similar to the business model of running an open source software business. If you assume that an open source software business is a business whose model is um, predicated um, on providing the software without a license fee and then selling services around that software, then essentially the legal model is providing documents without a license. I've never charged a license fee for any documents I produce. So um, pr providing those documents without a license fee and then providing services around those documents. And the, I, 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 can't, I can't see any, any reason why you shouldn't be able to su supply the same things. I, I do not believe that anyone has ever chosen me as a lawyer because my documents are a key differentiator. You know, nobody is going to say, you know, we have to go to that Andrew Katz because his distribution agreements are so much better than anyone else's. No lawyer has ever had that experience. And I doubt very much they ever were. So for me, the document's not a key differentiator. So therefore, it should be the case that we can make them available under an open source mechanism other lawyers can take them, use them, improve them, improve them, feed the improvements back for the benefit of everyone, and we can concentrate on adding value where we really do add value, uh, which is the advice that surrounds those documents. Can I ask another question or not? Can we, do you have time to ask another question or for the debate? No, no, uh, I have just one more question to you. Uh, getting back to the introduction, uh, I said that uh, uh, you are the new Chief Operating Officer of Maria DB Foundation. That's right, that's right. It's very interesting because, as I know, Maria DB Foundation, the purpose of Maria DB Foundation is to secure the development of my single database, yeah. not under the Oracle umbrella, but uh, under an independent yes. Uh, yes. foundation umbrella. And you said in your speech that lawyers are strange people, but are, at the end they are useful. So the question is, why this foundation has chosen you, a lawyer, to be the chief operating officer? Yeah, that is, that's a very good question. Um, the reason is that this is purely, purely an interim role, um, so I'm going to be taking this role until some point in February, um, at which point we will launch the foundation proper. And my job is to work in the background to ensure that the foundation has got an appropriate constitution, um, has got um, all of the um, appropriate rights that it needs to work um, and uh, to make sure that it has everything that uh, the, a um, potential sponsor um, or a potential member or a potential contributor or development uh, would want to see um, in a well-run foundation <coughs> that's going to last for some time. So it's not, not my job to go out there and evangelize about it. Um, it um, really is my job. I've been described as, uh, as the grey man. It's, it's, my, it's my job to make sure that all of the paperwork um, and that all of the legal technicalities uh, are uh, as tight as they possibly can be so that the foundation is in the best possible position uh, to move on once it's got the permanent board appointed. Thank you. Uh, oh, one more question. In the meantime, Oliver Jean is here for the seventh session. Okay, if you can. I, I really regret that I missed most of your session. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, just what you said there is interesting. I know that the OpenStack Foundation, for example, has had uh, considerable uh, has put considerable effort into trading off, uh, locking down the legal documents, yes. and having something which human beings can read. Yes. Um, how are you handling that in Um We're at the sort of meta stage when we're at the stage of deciding how we're going to handle how we're going to. Um, so the answer is uh, we do want to make the documentation as transparent as possible. We want to make it as um, uh, as easy to read by humans, non strange, um, as, as possible. Um, we uh, are having a sort of internal discussion um, with Monty and the various other interested parties at the moment to determine the best way to go ahead and do that. 
Um, but uh, we, we should have a sort of fairly good roadmap um, within the next few days almost in terms of um, how we're then going to go ahead and try to get as you know, many of the interested parties involved as we can. Thank you. Yes, I will bear that in mind. Thank you for your presentation. We, uh, of course, uh, we will have a final debate, so if you have more questions, we can debate at the end of this talk. And it is now the time for a first 777 session. Oliver Jean, you have five minutes to present. Seven minutes, sorry, sorry.